What is the best Pokemon? A wise woman once said, truly skilled trainers should try to win with their favorites. And that woman, Eleanor Rose, wait, I mean Karen. These words ignited a spark in me to show some love to my favorite Pokemon amongst the over 1,000 Mons that have been created over these nearly 30 years, Blitzel. Despite completely missing out on the fifth generation of Pokemon games, some of my favorite designs come from the Unova region. However, out of all of them, the one that stole my heart was the Electric Zebra line, Blitzel, and Zebstrika. And when I found out that the Indigo Disc DLC was bringing back the black and white baby for the Blueberry Academy, I was to the moon with excitement. So, in order to celebrate the return of My Little Pony, I dedicated a whole challenge run to my favorite Pokemon and to put Karen's quote to the test. I would attempt to play through the entirety of the story of Pokemon White using only a Blitzel. No evolutions and no overleveling at gyms. It would come down to strategy and luck to see if we could blitz through the battles without too many bruises. But I was determined to show everyone why Blitzel is the best Pokemon. This is the Pokemon White Blitzel solo run. Our story begins, like any other good story, in autumn. Our best friends, Sharon and Bianca, come to our home to open the gift that we got from Professor Mommy. I, I mean, Mommy Juniper. I from Professor Juniper. We open the gigantic box and inside, we are welcomed with the mare with the best mohawk mane. We pick out our Blitzel and instantly begin a battle with Bianca. And of course, this little cutie would be able to take out Bianca's Pokemon with no problem. Okay, we might die here. <laughs> Unless we get a crit. Miss? Oh, okay. Oh. We tried. Oh, well. Despite the type advantage we had against Oshawott, our Blitzel's quick attacks are just not strong enough to take out the Otter, and we lose in our first battle. Rough start, but obviously Blitzel will show her true power soon. I know it. And luckily, these fights don't need to be won in order to progress the story. So after our entire room gets destroyed, just like our little zebra, we get thrown from one battle into the next, now against Sharon. While we should have lost this fight, Sharon must have been feeling bad for us because he ended up going for another tail whip when he could have easily tackled, allowing us to quick attack to take out his burning bacon pig. After we receive an Apple Watch from our mom and stand idly by as Bianca gets very Verbally berated by her father, we head to the lab to see the hot single professors in our area and decide to help her with her research. In the lab, we also were given a chance to name our little Blitzel. As a huge thank you to a viewer who dropped a 100 sub bomb right before the run began, I decided to name our first and only Pokemon for this run after them. So, welcome in Nair the Blitzel. With our new Pokedexes, our iconic threesome walked towards Route 1. While I do enjoy the new rivals in the more recent games, I will say that it was extremely refreshing to have two rivals that push the player character in different yet equally supportive ways. As we take our first steps onto Route 1 together, we were now ready for the adventure of a life to play Pokemon. Oh, f I forgot we have to do this. Okay, now we were ready for the adventure of a lifetime. For this run, I choose to have Nair grind on Patrads and Lillipups on this route for one reason, EVs. I've previously explained EVs in other videos, but for a quick recap, it's a hidden point value that each Pokemon you face gives you to a specific stat after being fainted. And for every four EVs you have in a stat, it would equate to one additional stat point by the time that Pokemon hit level 100. And luckily for us, both Lillipup and Patrat both give EVs in attack. That means the more of these little rats and dogs we take out, the more buff our Blitzel's attack stat gets, which can help us out with those powerful physical moves Blitzel can learn, like the base 65 stomp, huh? or the base 50 flame charge. I guess wild charge is kind of strong. Regardless, I check out Nair's summary real quickly and see that our ability is Motor Drive, which is nice because it gives us an immunity to electric moves while also giving us a chance to increase our speed. On top of that, we also have a quiet nature. Our soft-spoken Blitzel could hit harder with our special attacks, and we would only have to trade it for a drop in our decent speed stat. While not the best nature, it would definitely help us for those extremely early game battles where we have to depend on our special electric moves. After grinding to level 9, we run into our first encounter with the obligatory evil team of the generation, Team Plasma. This team of Ed Sheerans in tight hoodies is led by Getsis, and the supposed Pokemon liberation that he spouts off about honestly does make a little bit of sense. Saying that Pokemon get pushed around and lecturing that they should be seen as equals honestly does hit me a little bit as a bleeding heart. 
I mean, who would ever want to treat their Pokemon in inhumane ways? Like, I don't know, making their baby horse fight a legendary dragon with world-destroying powers. After hearing the words of Gay Sex, we meet the final rival of the game, a green-haired man who can understand what animals are saying. So pretty much the Aquaman equivalent of the Pokemon universe? N challenges us to hear our Pokemon's voice again, which is a weird fucking thing to say, but okay. And Nair makes quick work against his purloin. With all that out of the way, we can make our way towards Route 2 and then enter Striaton City. Ah, oh, fuck. Please heal me before you fight me. We entered the rival battle half cocked and at half health, so we get one shotted by an extremely unlucky tackle crit from Bianca's dopey ass dog, leading to the first official feint of the run. This leads us to what are the two most important aspects of doing a solo run in any Pokemon game? Game knowledge and RNG. If you don't know when random rival battles are going to pop up or what Pokemon your opponent is going to send out, any solo run can quickly turn from smooth sailing to making a mess on the poop deck. After all, any mistake on our part could lead to the best Pokemon of all time having to be sent all the way back to the Pokemon Center. But I'm sure we won't make that mistake again. <laughs> Get that f***ing foreshadowing image off the screen. Our second attempt fares much better as we were able to bring down both her lily pup and Oshwat with little issue, and now we can actually enter Striaton City. However, while we were able to take on the bouncy blonde Bianca, we still had another clever and challenging comrade to confront, Sharon. Now that I was actually preparing for these fights beforehand, I knew that Tepig's only fire move was Ember, a special move. So with our newly learned move Charge, it would not only increase our special defense to help us easily take an Ember, but it also doubles the power of our Shockwave to take down the Tep- Oh mother f Anyway, one more Shockwave against Tepig and a Charge Shockwave combo allows us to take out his following Purloin. Now defeated, Sharon gives us an item that would be crucial for the early fights of this run. Orange berries. As you may know, berries can be held by Pokemon in order to do a wide variety of effects, such as heal them at a low health or get rid of a status condition. However, for some reason, in Unova, there are no wild berry trees. Since this region is based off New York, we can probably blame that on the pollution in the air. So, these berries from Sharon could help us get out of some sticky situations in these early game fights. With our two rivals now knowing the power of Blitzel, we enter the Striaton Gym and, with our handy dandy type chart, answer some of the most difficult questions in the game. Okay, so we have fire, so, um, uh, whew, got nervous there for a second. We make our way to the back of the gym to face off the rowdy rough boys, and because Blitzel took the place of Snivy in our run, we step up to face the first gym leader of the run, Chili, the fire user of Striton Gym. He starts off with his lily pup, which seems like it wouldn't be a threat. Seems being the keyword. Okay, this little pup's dead as doornails, chat. Go. Ooh, you! Oh, what? Seems is definitely the keyword here. While Nair does outspeed, the dog once again lives on one, and a singular bite takes down the Blitzel, leading to our second loss. Despite being gung ho for our fight, I was quickly humbled into remembering Blitzel's pitiful base 32 defense. That means it has the same defense stat as a Surskit, a literal bug so light that it can float on water, and a worse defense stat than Caterpie. F***ing Caterpie. Despite all of this though, I still believed in Blitzel. I jumped headfirst into the gym battle once again against Chili. While we don't get a one-shot with our Charge Shockwave combo, Chili's Lola Pup goes for workup twice for some reason this time around. While another bite takes nearly half of our HP the following turn, we faint Chili's Pup with just one more Shockwave. We're luckily able to level up mid-battle with a technique Nuzlockers call edging. Stop laughing, not like that, you pervert. Edging is a technique of grinding your XP up to nearly the next level, allowing your Pokemon to technically stay under the level caps of a gym, while also capitalizing on the stat increases and, in this case, new moves that could be used in battle. Our Blitzel could now learn Thunder Wave, one of the most crucial moves for this run. As I said before, RNG will be both our greatest enemy and our savior. The ability to paralyze our foes would not only drop their speed down to a middling 25% in Gen 5, but it would also give us a chance to avoid any hits 30% of the time if the opponent fully paralyzes. After we learn Thunder Wave, Chili sends out his ace, a monkey who looks like he has a pile of flaming shit on his head. With only the moves incinerate and workup, I went for the special defense boost and charge and then shockwave to bring the monkey down to low. Chili once again opts for the double workup, allowing us to electrocute the rest of Pan 
Sensier's HP with just one more shockwave. These three waiters just got served, and we take out an order of the trio badge, marking our first badge of Gen 5. Outside the gym, we meet Fennel, a scientist who is working on a feature that is only available in Gen 5, so let's not focus on that. And she gives us something that's actually important, the HM for cut. After catching a little pat rat pal as our HM homie, we enter the dream yard with Bianca and come across two Team Plasma members, fighting the good fight to free Pokemon by kicking Amuna. Oh my god, I think they actually might be evil. After we defeat the two grunts and the mommy Musharna traumatizes them enough that you'd hope that Team Plasma's health plans include therapy, Fennel receives some dream mist to make some bullshit that we can't use. Hooray! On the next route, we use our zebra to beat up some kids and take their money, and then we get yet another rival battle jump scare against Sharon that we quickly sweep with the classic charge shockwave combo. However, the high octane action that is Gen 5 doesn't stop there, as we now have to help a small child get their Pokemon back from the dastardly Team Plasma. You know that they're evil because they're literally robbing children. Uh, I'd like to point out that I didn't rob the children I faced, I won that money, fair and square. With Sharon's help, we quickly take out the grunts once again and return the sad child's lost Pokemon. See, I don't hate children. I literally just helped a child right here. Once we reach Nat Green City, we beeline into the house with an ace trainer in order to get the charcoal, which will be very important soon in our run. With this crucial item aside, though, we were ready to take on the second gym lead. Oh, it's N. God damn it. I really should look up where all these rival battles are because f there are so many of them. Anyway, we take out N's team and our Blitzel hits level 18, meaning we could now learn Flame Charge. Not only would this move allow us to hit grass types that normally resist electric type moves and the bug types in the upcoming gym, but the secondary effect of increasing our speed by 50% definitely would help later on in the game. After N sulks away, we make our way to the back of the museum for the gym challenge. While most of the trainers in the gym aren't an issue because of the grinding that we did earlier, I run into a scientist with a herd ear, and as early as the second gym, I'm starting to see that Blitzel might be a problematic fave. She was already getting outclassed by middle evolution Pokemon due to her low stats, and we unfortunately can't take out this herd ear and get sent back to the Pokemon Center. Even after stocking up on super potions and paralyzing with our thunder waves, we were struggling against a single herdier. And spoiler alert, the gym leader not only has one of these powerful pups herself, but also a watchhog who could easily defeat our lovely little zebra. Third time, however, is the charm. We luckily get a full para on the herdier that allows Nair to finally shockwave scientist Satomi's herdier out of the battle. With all the trainers now out of the way and Nair holding an Oranberry for some additional HP, we were now ready to take on the leader of Nuvema City's gym, Lenora. Now, miss, miss, miss! It's gonna do a lot of damage. Okay, this is gonna be hard. <laughs> we might just reset. Retaliate! Ah, sh Well, we're dead. Okay. We were not ready to take on Lenora. Despite all of the level grinding we did, our stats were still not high enough to get that one hit kill on the Herdier. That on top of Leers constantly dropping our paper thin defenses and all of the stab boosted normal type moves, Lenora's Herdier was walling us off from beating the rest of this fight. However, while trying to find a solution, game knowledge once again comes to save the day. Hold on, hold on, hold on. What I didn't realize before taking on Lenora was that in one of the lower warehouses of this town, there's an NPC who is selling what would be the most important items of the entire run. For this playthrough, we could utilize items in battle. That means I would not only be able to use healing items such as super potions and status clearing items like the full heal, but I could also use one of the most broken items ever introduced to the Pokemon universe, drugs. The X items are items that increase the stat of a Pokemon by one stage, or by 50% for the majority of the time. These, on top of the guard specs that would protect us from status dropping moves, and the dire hit that would double our critical hit rate, are some of the best items to help a solo run. So, I decided to stock up on X specials to increase the power of our shockwaves, as well as some X defense to hopefully sponge up some of those beefy physical type moves. With our bag now full of performance enhancing X items, we were now ready to take on Lenora. For real this time. On attempt 5, we were able to take down the Herdier for the first time after some X defense allow us to tank some takedowns. However, her terrifying Watchhog not only outspeeds, but is able to use Retaliate the first turn out, allowing her to get the boosted 140 base damage out to easily one-shot our Blitzel. On attempt 6, we add in some X specials to increase our Shockwave damage, as well as Flame Charge against the Herdier to hopefully allow us to outspeed her upcoming Watchhog. However, we unfortunately get sent back to the center with a crit. 
Critical hits not only double the damage of a move, but they also ignore all defensive stat increases of the opponent, including X item increases. At this point, I was second guessing myself, wondering if I should increase the level caps in order to make this fight even close to possible. However, whether it was my stubbornness or it being attempt number seven, I had a good feeling about this next run, and all I needed was a little bit of luck from lucky number seven. Battle item, X defend. Okay, so X defend, take down, does damage. I obviously meant lucky number eight would be the one. I start off by setting up three X defends to help us tank any hits from that strong Scotty dog of hers, and then a thunder wave to not only slow her down, but luckily get a full paralysis the first turn. We set up two X specials and then use flame charge to increase our speed. Another full para lets us take down the herdier with one shockwave and leaves us with a decent amount of HP going into Watchhog. Once again, the confusing AI leaves me in a strange situation. Will the Watchhog go for a hypnosis like it did in attempt five, or will it go for a powerful retaliate that could bring us down low once again? After weighing the options, I go for Thunder Wave to get R and Jesus on our side. The powerful retaliate, however, does come out, but with our X defense spam, we were barely able to live on 10. With one super potion and a hypnosis miss, we're able to take Watchdog down to a sliver of health. While the next hypnosis lands and Lenora uses the turn of sleep to bring her Watchhog back to nearly full with a super potion, we can use an awakening to wake up Nair the following turn and bring Watchhog back to fainting range. While this fight is looking dire, against all odds, Watchhog misses another 60% accurate hypnosis. With that, Blitzel sends a final shockwave to take down the Watchhog, defeating Lenora. After a quick Fortnite dance, we have now earned the basic badge. After the first two gyms, I was thrilled with how Blitzel was doing. Sure, we had to fill her with more drugs than EDC 2019, but even then, she overcame so many difficult battles already, despite the level cap. Our celebration, however, is cut short after Team Plasma comes to steal a skull. Whoa, not the skull. So what, no head? <laughs> Running after the thieves, we meet this very flamboyant man and enter the obligatory early forest route. That is only after we get wiped by a nurse outside the forest entrance. I guess the Hippocratic Oath doesn't exist in the Pokemon universe. After receiving the gigantic skull from the final grunt, wait, where was he keeping that? We meet the best character in the entire game. GORM! Motherfucking Gorm of the motherfucking Seven Sages. With the skull back in Lenora's hands, we could now make our way to one of the most climactic moments of the game. Check it out, chat. Whoa! Just like the trailers, chat. Wow, this is actually really cool. Castelia City is a giant town filled with items, but there are only two important for our run, and neither of them are the Flash TM. Oh, I found them. Okay, yep, there's a man who flashes us. The first of the two is the Attractium, which you get from a girl at this house party that you crash. While we don't use it now, just remember that we have this in our bag. Before we take on the Castelia City gym though, Team Plasma shows their red heads once again, and we have to help Bianca get her Muna back from Getsus, and it's totally not evil plans to use a world-destroying dragon to hopefully bring people together. Sure. But who cares about that when we have another gym to take on? After we take out the literal clowns littering the gym and go through the honey quicker than Winnie the Pooh on a bender, we give Nair the charcoal to help increase the damage of her flame charges and then skitter up to take on the bug type gym leader of Castelia City, Berg. I unfortunately see that the flame charge without any X attack investment is a three hit kill against his Whirlipede. This on top of a poison proc from Poison Tail takes us down, leading to a reset. However, the second time around, I had updated my plan of attack and led my second attempt with a Thunder Wave. Poison Tail luckily doesn't do much damage, even without an X defend, so we safely set up two X attacks. A plus two flame charge unfortunately only leaves Whirlipede in the red, but luckily Berg burns through both of his hyper potions to save the Roly Poly, allowing us to take down the Whirlipede with just two more flame charges. We heal up in front of the Dwubble, but do unfortunately get hit by a sand attack that drops our accuracy. We should be able to kill after one more X attack, but we unfortunately miss. The next flame charge does land its mark, but we unfortunately roll extremely low on our damage and he lives on one. No matter as we go for a shockwave since it can never miss, and that leaves Berg with his ace, Leivani. With plus three in our attack, a four times effective flame charge, and a charcoal boost to boot, I had a feeling that we may be able to Oko the cunty bug. 
However, because of our dropped accuracy, I thought that healing might be a good idea. Razor Leaf. This might do some damage. I think this kills. Oh, I thought it missed. I got so scared. Yeah! Second try, gamers. With that, our bug zapping Blitzel has defeated Berg and we receive our third badge, the Insect Badge. With the level caps now increased, Nair would be able to learn one of the only few physical electric moves available to her, Spark. While it was only a base 65 damage, it has a chance to paralyze and it would at least utilize our better physical attack stat for upcoming battles. As I mentioned before the gym, there were two items that would be crucial for us to grab from Castelia before we left. The Attract TM, which we would need later, and the second item, the Evolite. In case you don't know what this item does, the Evolite raises both the physical and special defense of a Pokemon by a whopping 50%. The only stipulation is that it has to be a non-fully evolved Pokemon. But lucky for us, Blitzel is just a baby, meaning we could utilize this item. All we had to do to get this item was see 25 different Pokemon. After beating two different gyms and visiting three different towns, I surely must have been able to see enough Pokemon. Oh, I'm literally one Pokemon away. I surely did not. This meant that I would have to go up against Bianca in the tunnel towards Route 4 Sans Evil Light. Despite her terrifying terrier, we can paralyze it with a spark and take it down in just two hits. Her newly evolved Duat, Muna, and Pansir all quickly follow after with the help of the X attack boosted sparks, and our victory leads to Bianca reassessing her entire life. Fun! After inspiring Bianca to rewrite her entire four-year plan, we have now registered more than 25 Pokemon in our Pokedex, so we can now find the scientist who will give us the Evil Light. With our new shiny stone on our Blitzel, we could now take on the next rival battle against Sheeran, confidently allowing us to take more hits against its Pig Knight. Uh-oh, wait, do we die here? The answer is yes. Even with our new Eviolite, Light, Blitzel goes down a second time due to a blaze boosted flame charge that ends up critting us, bypassing any defense boost from the Eviolite. Light. And then a third time due to, well, I'll just let you watch. What is this critical hit bullshit that's going on right now in the chat? In the chat, in the game is what I meant to say. Are you fucking kidding me? Luckily for us, we don't get hit by any wayward crits the fourth time around, letting us clean up Sharon's team after setting up just two X attacks while facing the Pi Dove. Pig Knight, Pansage, and Leopard all go down in a single hit the following turns. With that out of the way, we could now- No, you do not get to evolve. You stay baby. You do not get to change. No, bad. With that out of the way, we could now make our way to Nimbasa City by traversing the sandy streets of Route 4. And to avoid any overleveling, I just had to carefully maneuver around these optional trainers. Okay, don't look at me. Son of a bitch! Fucking solid snake over here. Regardless, once we enter Nimbasa City, we save an old man who gives us a bike that I guess he's just keeping in his pockets, and get the strength TM. Fun fact, you don't even have to use this TM to beat the game. Cool. After dressing up our Pokemon like the horse girl I truly am, we could now focus on something more important than Bianca's family issues. Going on a date with our socially awkward green-haired pronouns boyfriend, N. After yet another cool cutscene, we're rudely interrupted by some Team Plasma grunts once again and have to face N so that he doesn't have to tell his friends about our date. Okay, I get it, I'm embarrassing. Despite some potentially difficult mons like the ground-type Sandile and a swaggering Scrafty, our X items help us take him down quickly with little issue, and then gets so close to our face that his pixels actually become full-blown character art. Weird how he's literally the only character in the entire game who gets this treatment. And then, we're finally ready to take on the gym. For the third badge, we had to take on fellow Electric-type trainers. While this could have been an issue, a majority of the Pokemon here are a Molga, which still take neutral damage due to also being a flying type. On top of that, the other Blitzels we face don't have the added benefits of Eviolite, so we can easily tank their attacks while dishing out as much, if not more, damage back. Also, I'm still confused about how to say this item's name. Evolite. Eviolite. Eviolite. Eviolite? Eviolite. What am I saying wrong? You guys keep telling me I'm saying it wrong, and I don't know what I'm doing. Ignoring my inability to grasp the English language, we defeat all the gym trainers and can start our electrifying face-off against the third gym leader of Unova, Elisa of the Nimbasa Gym.
While it goes for a pursuit, I set up two X attacks and an X defend. A flame charge also helps speed up our bolting blitzel, and we can take out the flying rodent in just one single spark. Zepstrika comes straight out, which does scare us a little bit. Oh, you just go straight for Zepstrika. Okay, that's cool. A critical hit quick attack does a decent chunk of damage, but Lisa goes for a Volt Switch the following turn that is absorbed by our ability, letting us land a critical flame charge in response. Look at him. This is my little brother when it was his turn on the f***ing Wii. One more flame charge helps us take out Big Bro, and Elisa's second Emolga is no match for Nair's boosted sparks. And with that, we show Elisa who the better electric type user was and bring home the Bolt Badge. Now, while our win against Elisa was hype as hell, there was a scary cowboy-sized shadow looming over me at this point. However, we don't have much time to worry as the next stream starts on Route 5 with yet another battle with Sharon. While we once again sweep through his team, Nair levels up and learns a new move that could help us cheese our way to victory. And boy, do I love a little cheddar. Stomp, a normal type move with only a base 65 damage, comes with the additional bonus of flinching 30% of the time. This on top of the 25% chance of immobilization from paralysis means that 35% of the time, our opponent would be left completely helpless and we were free to deal as much damage as possible. With Stomp now on our moveset, we can take on the rest of Sharon's team and then meet this homeless man who also happens to be the Unovan Pokemon League champion. Boy, I can't wait to face him at the end of the game. Why are you looking at me like that? Anyway, this double battle with five-year-olds actually is one of the hardest battles that we've faced so far, and Nair actually faints from a double takedown from these damn herdiers. I swear I'm going to hate this Pokemon by the end of the run. Luckily, Sharon's Leopard is still alive and can easily get rid of the herd of herdiers the following turns. Elisa calls up her boo to lower the bridge for her, and we get another classic cinematic Unovan experience. Across the bridge, we are welcomed by the bane of electric Pokemon, Clay of Driftvale City. He blames us for Team Plasma escaping when the bridge came down. A cab, by the way. So, a couple of teenagers are instead asked to do the police's job by checking out the cold storage south of the city. We enter the fridge to go through some ice puzzles. Boy, glad those are here. At the end of the frozen puzzle, we find a storage unit filled with a bunch of men huddled together. Cool. After taking on four grunts back to back, the cops finally arrive. A little bit too late, I might add, a cab. But once we arrive at the gym, Clay just lets them leave because Getsis tells him to? Like, there's no trial or even a bail to pay? He literally just lets them leave? A cab? God, I'm gonna be so happy when I kick this man's ass. Since we were unable to do any of our classic paralysis tactics due to the ground types being immune to our thunder waves and sparks, we did have some difficulty knocking out Pokemon. However, the power of drugs helps us still go through the gym without a wipe. We take the elevator deep into the earth and enter Clay's domain. Because of our ground weakness and limited move pool, I wasn't confident that we were going to be able to defeat him on our first attempt. However, I thought that scouting out what his AI would do could be helpful. So, with hesitance in my heart, I challenged the gym leader of Driftvale City, Clay. Starting off with his Krokorok, I decided that setting up several X defense would be best since the majority of his team used physical moves. Bulldoze does less than half after just one X defend, and then he attempts to torment us, which leads us to just set up more. A Swagger further helps increase our attack, but does leave us confused. We luckily have one full heal to remove our confusion though, and go for Stomp. While this does take Krokorok down below half, another Swagger comes out to confuse us once more. With no more full heals, we had to hopefully not take ourselves out on accident. While we do faint the Krokorok, Palpitoad, Clay's special attacker, comes out right after. A Muddy Water Mist allows Nair to heal back up to full, and with even more luck, we snap out of confusion instantly and get a plus four stomp out for major damage. Clay burns a Hyper Potion while we speed up with one more Flame Charge, and a stomp the following turn pops the Pimple Toad with ease. Finally was the terrifying ace of Clay's gym, Excadrill. We luckily have a super effective move in Flame Charge, but would a plus four attack get the kill with such a weak base damage? I go for the flame charge and, unfortunately, only leave him in the red. It all came down to if Excadrill can land a crit to break through our defenses. And, to our luck, he does not. With the torment still in place, we have to go for a stomp, allowing Clay to heal a majority of the HP of his spiky mole. 
However, one more flame charge seals the deal and Clay's ace melts under the pressure of the zebra. Whether it was luck or skill, our Blitzel was a trooper and one try was all it took for us to beat Clay's gym. With my confidence now at an all-time high, we put away the Quake badge, ready to take on the rest of the game, and nothing would slow us down. Oh, hey, Bianca. Get out here. Razor Shell is gonna do... Side Beam is gonna do some dan... Well, glad I can get humbled so quickly. The following attempt, her Herdier and Oshawott were no issue, and we luckily get a few paraflinches against her Musharna. Once we were slept by a Hypnosis, though, I set up an X Defend to take her side beams easily, and then feed Nera Chesto Berry to wake up. With a few more paraflinches with Stomp, Musharna finally goes down, and we defeat the grueling Bianca rival fight. She gives us HMO2 as a prize, meaning that I could now fly around Unova to not only speed up the story, but also give us a chance to easily fly back to Nuvema Town to see our dealer. We catch Morse the Ducklet outside of Driftvale as our next HM homie, and fun fact, that's the only other HM that we'll be using for this generation. We continue on to Route 6, where items seem to litter the ground. Among Us! And then meet Clay in front of the Charged Stone Cave. A bulldog gave me damage and a little Pokemon spear here hit you now with a ground Pokemon. Let me start it. I think if you're a bulldog, right, you can carry out all their weakness there. Yeah. Are you saying words? Yeah, the words are, are clearly on stream right now, chat. Once entering Charged Stone Cave, we see N and... Ah! Oh. Come. A lot just happened in the last five seconds. N tells us that Team Plasma is waiting to test us, and we were able to journey further into the cave. We push through the gigantic crystals, take on grunts, and then have a full conversation about Ed Sheeran's face. Uh, the caption of this photo that I'm about to show you is Ed Sheeran on having more kids. I don't know why either. <laughs> Regardless, we finally get to the end of the cave, finding N once more babbling about his dreams, and then he springs into action. An interesting aspect of N's character is that his team changes nearly every fight, something I didn't realize until now. Another less fun thing I didn't realize until this fight was that because of all the required plasma fights up until this point, our PP was nearly gone on all of Nair's moves. On top of that, Bulldor had a high defense stat, so many of our physical moves were doing very little against it. Despite a para, we unfortunately get crit by the sentient stones, taking down Blitzel once again. We backtrack our way through the cave, and then on our second attempt, I set up some X attacks to help us actually hit Boldor a little harder, letting us take it down after several sparks. Joltik, Pharaoh Seed, and Clink all take massive damage from Flame Charge, meaning the rest of the fight was a breeze, and N takes another L. We finally enter Miss Dralton Town, where we meet Cedric, Professor Juniper's father, and Skyla, our next victim- uh, I mean, gym leader. After carefully traversing the balancing beams of Route 7, we enter the Celestial Tower and have to fight our way up to the top. We do unfortunately get wiped by a trainer using a Golet. However, this reset actually leads me to a discovery about the trainers in this tower. Oh my god, wait, if you just press the B button, they just turn. How fast can I press the B button? Puke! Using this new strat, I was able to quickly get to the tower rooftop to meet Skyla again, and she returns to her gym after we ring her bell. Back in Mistralton, we enter her gym for what is probably the most dangerous gym challenge for not our Pokemon, but for the trainer. Being shot through the air by a cannon multiple times at high speeds, and then once into a damn wall. Ow. That's a felony. Before we can check for any head trauma though, we have to take on the head of the Mistralton City Gym, the flying type leader, Skyla. We set up an X Defend to help tank heart stamps from her Swoobat, and then X attacks to easily one-shot the Lovey Dubby Bat with just one spark. When Unpheasant comes out, I use one flame charge to help boost our speed, and then quickly take her out with one more spark. And finally, all that was left was Skyla's ace, a Swana. <laughs> Well, that was anticlimactic. We zoomed our way through the fight and ended up with the jet badge after a flawless victory. And to think, I thought that Blitzel was getting outpaced all the way back at Lenora. Sure, we've had a few difficult fights against rivals, but those were merely chalked up to bad RNG, right? It can't be due to the fact that Blitzel is a stage 1 Pokemon with a base stat total lower than Bellsprout, right? Right? After this cakewalk of a gym, I left to- Oh! Sorry. 
Jesus Christ, can we put a bell on him or something? And does drop some insightful takes on if Pokemon battles are terrible or not as a concept, but then quickly throws me off by saying this. Hey, Blitzel. <laughs> Would you tell me what kind of trainer Danny is? So Danny was born in New Vet- What the f**k? Why does Blitzel know- <laughs> Blitzel doxing you? Outside of Blitzel nearly giving out our social security number, we learned that Team Plasma is trying to use the light and dark stone to resurrect the dragons of legend to help fulfill Team Plasma's plans. With not much time to process our awkward encounter, I ran into Sharon once again. While we do take out his Unpheasant and Pig Knight, his newly evolved Simusage actually gives us a bit of a headache and lands a critical seed bomb to take us out. However, our second attempt is successful without any critical hits for us to worry about, and we're able to take down his entire team with just 4x defense and 2x attacks. Sharon and our character then get interrupted by Alder. The champion uses some career fair mumbo jumbo to help Sharon think critically about what he wants to do after beating the league. And I guess he just realizes that I'm still here, so he gives us the Surf HM. This means that we could now enter Twist Mountain. And with only two badges left, I'll be honest, while Blitzel's cuteness may be off the charts, I could definitely start noticing how Blitzel's stats were starting to be a detriment. Even on random trainers, we were having difficulty living hits. We lost to the first trainer at the opening of Twist Mountain, embarrassingly. However, after finding success during our second attempt, we actually have a chance to learn Wild Charge, the strongest physical electric move that our zebra can learn. While this may be a nice power boost, I decided that this move would actually not be beneficial for our run. You see, while Wild Charge does a nice chunk of damage, there were two major downsides. One, we don't have a chance to paralyze, a status a majority of our strategies revolved around. And two, Wild Charge also gave us recoil damage. While this may not be a big deal when running a full team, it was way too risky to run a move that could potentially put us in kill range against any threatening opponents. We maneuver our way through the tunnel, and then we meet an extremely excited Plasma Grunt, who just tells us that they finally found the power to free all Pokemon. We chase after them, only to run into Cedric once again. While he goes off to investigate Dragon Spiral Tower, we could now make our way to Isaris City to face the next gym. And of course, it's more ice puzzles. Yay, we love ice puzzles. Yay. How can I make this more sarcastic? Yay. Luckily, our Blitzel burns brighter than the sun with her flame charges, and she sweeps through the trainers of the gym with little difficulty. After a quick grocery run back in Novema, we were ready to talk to Bryce. You appear ready to face a gym leader. Then, bring it! Oh, wow. No fluff. They just jump into the fights. While we were able to set up an ex spadef off the bat, I realized that both his Vanillish and Krygonagal have Frost Breath, which will always do critical damage. This means no matter how many ex spadefs I set up, it will always break through our defenses and do the most amount of damage. Luckily, Frost Breath is only removing half of Nair's health, so I was able to cycle between X attacks and Hyper Potions to keep our little girl strong. Once we were at plus 2 in our attack, I went for a Flame Charge, which unfortunately does less than half because of the Nightmare Fuel Ice Cream Cone setting up Acid Armors. I decide to pop a Dire Hit over an X attack, however, despite this, our next two Flame Charges don't crit. This means this frozen freak of nature could get one more Frost Breath and have a chance to faint Nair. Unless this does low roll. Low roll, chat. Hope for a low roll. Yes! Blitzel shows us once more what the power of friendship and complicated math can get us, allowing Bryson and I to heal our Pokemon in front of each other. Because of the constant attacks, I actually have to use an Aether to replenish our Flame Charge PP. I finally accept that we can't force crits to happen and instead give Blitzel an X attack. And of course, I get the crit the following Flame Charge. Cool, love that neat. Bryson then sends out Bear Tick, which actually surprises me. I decide to Thunder Wave to hopefully slow him down, but then get surprised by a Swagger. This actually does increase our attack, so I full heal to get rid of Nair's confusion while she takes a beefy icicle crash from the pulverizing polar bear. Luckily, we live and can retort by healing back up and setting up more X defense to mitigate some of Bear Tick's damage. Flame charge. Because we have like plus six attack now, because he swaggered us. With that drippy threat now gone, all that's left is Crygonagal. Crygonagal, more like you're gonna be crying a ton of gold because we're gonna kill you four gyms all first try blitzel is our baby and we did it gamers
with ice in our veins and the freeze badge in our case, we walk out of the gym and are welcomed by our rivals once more. And then Bryson shows us why he's a cold ass motherfucker by calling out the hidden Shadow Triad members. Team Plasma's plans were now in full swing, meaning we had to make our way to Dragon Spiral Tower, parkour across some architectural anomalies, and fight through a slew of Plasma Grunts. Burn, baby, but Axel? After we meet Jello, 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 Jesus fucking Christ. After we, what's his name? After we meet Giallo, he throws four back-to-back -back battles at us. However, Blitzel blasts through them and we continue our journey up to the final level for one of the dopest moments of Pokemon history. Oh, shit! Yo, wait a second, this is so cool! What is this? Oh my god, I've literally never seen this before! N and his blue eyes white dragon were ready to take on the Pokemon League to fulfill his destiny. However, who needs a legendary dragon when you have a creature that has the power of both black and white on its side? Our Scooby squad reconvenes outside of the tower and then Alder tells us we should look for clues in the Relic Castle. Here, I run into the most difficult obstacle I've faced so far. Sand. How was... I... No, 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 no. Am I am I fucking dip? How how come I can't run out of that? Do I have to use my bike or something? Okay, that obviously wasn't right. Once we've bested the falling sand puzzle, clearly meant to be solved by only the most intelligent of minds, Plasma has yet another test for our power. You would think that we've passed these tests already, but okay, Ryoku. We make our way through the difficult maze until we finally see Getsus and Alder. Alder claims that he will not lose to N and he would fight for all trainers who love their Pokemon and all Pokemon who love their trainers. And as someone who's been fighting through great obstacles with a single Blissel, I'm sure that Alder could prevail as well. Because if he didn't do that, that would be extremely awkward. <laughs> <laughs> However, we don't have much time to reconvene as we get a call from Juniper once again to return to the museum in X Item City. With that, we were getting into the final stretch of the game, and Blitzel has been doing amazingly in all of these battles. Sure, we may have lost to a few rival battles and some random trainers, but with preparation and a little bit of luck, we've flown through the past few gyms with no issue. However, the final stretch of the game would be where everything comes together. Back in Nacreen City, Lenora gives us the Dark Stone to hopefully help us save the world. Wait, I'm still a teenager, right? Cool, just wanted to double check. And we make our way to Opelucid City to learn more about the legendary dragon type and hopefully receive our final badge. However, before we can go through Tube Line Bridge, I have to take on Bianca once more. Calculated chat. Oh, retaliate. Um, oh, that was her first Pokemon. Um, you'll get him next time, girly. Attempt two, we set up an X attack and get a para on the Stoutland. However, to my surprise, Nair gets roared out and Morse comes out. So I guess this is no longer a solo challenge. Failure. Okay, to be real, I didn't expect this. So I hoped Stoutland wouldn't set up more workups and use a status healing item to skip our turn. Stoutland luckily takes out Morse, which allows us to bring this challenge back on the rails. We take out the Stoutland with one more spark, but we unfortunately have to reset our X defenses and X attacks since we got switched. Simi Sears flame bursts end up not hitting too hard, so we can take out the ugly monkey with just two sparks. Samrock goes for a few Aqua Jets, nearly taking us out, but we still overcome the Water Warrior with two boosted sparks. And finally, her bulky Musharna. Psybeams take out a decent chunk of our HP, but Blitzel lands a whopping crit to take her into the red and help us heal through the rest of the fight. After one cinematic run across Two Blind Bridge, the Shadow Triad once again abducts us and moves us like five steps forward. The liberation of Pokemon of which I, of which, Team Plasma speaks of, sorry, I almost gave away my secret plan. Guys, I think Team Plasma might be evil. Anyway, here's my favorite, most shoehorned in TM gift in the entire Pokemon series. The pitcher throws his first pitch. <laughs> what the f We finally make it to Opelucid City, where Getsus is holding another motivational speaker talk. We also meet the gym leaders of Opelucid. Aw, uh -huh, he's gone. Is he okay? Wait, why am I making her sound like Dora? 
These might be my favorite characters that I've ever voiced. Drayden and Iris teach us about the story of the twin heroes and the ultimate dragon that was split into two. But despite all the turmoil, they tell us that Pokemon people need each other. And I can't help reflect that I felt the same way about Naren myself. The bond created by the two of us has strengthened, and I was determined in making sure that we can do this challenge together, despite all the great power of our opponents. While the two Dragon Masters don't know how to wake up the legendary dragon, we still have to win the final badge in order to make our way to the league. So, we enter Opelucid Gym, ready for our final challenge. This final gym was one where we had very few answers outside of the time-tested pairing of Para and Flint. Because dragons resist both our stab-boosted sparks and flame charges, all we could do is hope and pray towards R and Jesus that our opponents can't break through our status hell. We do have a few close calls with one trainer leaving us on just 4 HP, but luckily, we now could take on the final challenge before the Unova Elite Four. The dragon type user and leader of the Opelucid City Gym, Iris. She leads with Fracture. Blitzel responds with a Thunder Wave, which offsets the speed boost that she gets from Dragon Dance. We luckily set up an X attack for free when a full para comes out, and after one more X attack, we begin our para flinch strategy and luckily stun the Fracture for a KO in two stomps. Untouched, our Blitzel now has to face a Dredagon. Once again, we lead off with Thunder Wave because if it ain't broke, don't fix it, and the first turn full para allows us to get a little greedy and set up an X defend. However, our greed bites us instantly back because he goes for a Dragon Tail. And much like the PBS show of the same name, Dragon Tail takes the receiving Pokemon to a far, far away land and switches in another Pokemon in its place. And guess who still has more sitting in the back? Yup. Luckily, Dredagon takes out Morse the Ducklet in a single hit. However, this means that we have to repeat our setup of X items. We are able to set up X defense and X attacks luckily because Dredagon sits fully paralyzed for three turns in a row. Something to keep in mind is that this Dredagon actually has sheer force as an ability as opposed to rough skin, an ability that deals damage to the attacker if they use contact moves. So, while we may be taking more damage from moves like Night Slash, we're not chipping away our own health with our stomps, meaning that we can damage Spike the Terrifying Dragon with little issue and take him out with three attacks. All that's left is Iris's ace, Haxorus. Despite several X defend boosts, we still get a third of our HP knocked off by this threat. I unfortunately forget to Thunder Wave the Intimidating Dragon, but we luckily get a flinch off on our first stomp. A Thunder Wave the following turn then allows us to go for two more stomps, leaving Haxorus on one. Yes! We did it, chat! Oh, never mind, we didn't do it yet, but that's fine! Regardless, even after the heal, we bring Haxorus down to a third of his HP with two more stomps and get a full para to help us seal the deal. We dream of para, para, paralyze, para, para, paralyze, para, para, Paralyzed every time we close our eyes. Da 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 da. My album will be dropping in early 2024. Iris has been defeated and the legend badge has now been claimed. Juniper meets us outside the doors of the gym to let us know how to resurrect Zekron. And her findings are I decay, bro. Thanks, Juniper. However, we have to face our ever present rival, Sharon, one last time before embarking into our final journey. And after everything we've learned, I'm ready to show him that we can take on the Elite Four and Team Plasma with our single Blitzel. Takedown? Um, well, we would be ready the next time. For our second attempt, I set up before one-shotting Sharon's Unpheasant. We set up two more Expedefs against this Embor to take the Flamethrowers a little bit better. Our Spark luckily doesn't bring him down to Blaze range, so we can live one more Flamethrower and then spark his big Burning Boar out of battle. I do get surprised though when his Elvis Grass Monkey comes out and outspeeds with a Fury Swipes. Luckily, however, only three hits and no crit means that we can burn down the Leafy Simeon with a Flame Charge. All that was left was his Leopard to get one shot one last time, and we were ready to take on the journey to Victory Road. Dude, I don't want to fight all of you. Um, well, we were still ready. We would just need to avoid this guy. Dude, how? After two attempts, we finally made it to the badge check. As I walked through each gate, I had a chance to reflect on our journey. After eight gyms and countless rival battles, 
Nero the Blitzel has been able to zap through the entire region so far. I think that's pretty impressive for a little 295 stat total zebra. And all that was left for us was Victory Road and the Elite Four. While there are still a lot of difficult battles ahead, I wasn't going to sway from my laurels, and Blitzel would be the one to take us all the way to the credits. We were now officially in the endgame. After traversing through the Victory Road maze along with knocking out any trainers along the way, we approached the towering Colosseum of the Unovan Pokemon League. After a little bit of deliberation, I end off taking our tried and true moveset of Spark for damage, Thunder Wave for guaranteed paralysis, Stomp for the paraflinch, and Flame Charge for speed control and coverage. We proceed into the Elite Four, knowing that we could not leave until we either come out victorious or get sent back out to try another day. Gen 5 is the only Pokemon generation that allows you to choose which members you'd like to take on first, which is honestly a good plus for this run. However, at this point, I wasn't confident about who was truly the easiest, so I decided that I would attempt Chantal first. While a Ghost-type trainer would give us some difficulty because of the fact that we couldn't use a normal type stomp for our paraflinch strategy, I was still confident that we would find a strategy to beat her Ghastly group. I attempt to set up Expedefs against her lead, Kofagrigus, which seemed to work. However, the biggest obstacle we would have to overcome here were her Shadow Balls and Psychics, which both had a chance to drop our special defense. This would mean that Blitzel would not only take damage, but we could be put in a situation where we need to set up even more Expedefs due to stat drops, and more turns would mean more chances for Chantal to land a crit. Attempt 1 ends exactly this way. During Attempt 2, we do get several Expedefs and X attacks set up, however her Golurk is immune to our Sparks, meaning we have to go for Flame Charge. Even after a plus 4 in attack, it ends up doing less than 50%. Golurk's single Earthquake takes us out back to the beginning of the fight. Attempt 3 follows a similar strategy, but this time I set up 3 X Defends as well. We're taken down to single digits twice during this face-off, but with all of the setup, we were able to take her down with 3 Sparks. Her Golurk comes tumbling out, and I fully expect an Earthquake to come out. However, instead, Chantal opts for Curse, which if used by a Ghost-type will remove a quarter of my HP at the end of each turn. While we were able to take out Golurk with two Flame Charges this time around, Chandelure unfortunately lands some powerful Fire Blasts, which on top of Golurk's Curse, leaves us below 25% of our HP each time. We finally get a needed miss and we can paralyze the Chandelure. However, she lands a Fire Blast once more and we unfortunately fall to Curse damage. Despite the frustrating loss, we're still learning from each run. For attempt 4, we set up two Expedefs and then a Thunder Wave to allow for some potential full paras. Despite Kafagrigus dropping our special defense, we were able to get back up to plus 5 in our special defense and then max out our attack stat. It was now time for Nair to pick up a side hustle as a janitor because she was ready to sweep. One spark turns Kafagrigus to dust. The following Golurk doesn't go down with a single flame charge, but we live in Earthquake on a whopping 4 HP, allowing us to take the Titan down the following turn. Chandelure is no threat this time around and goes down with a single spark, and all that's left is her Jellicent. With it being a ghost water type, a single spark is more than enough to turn this jellyfish into jam. We have finally defeated our first Elite Four member. I was ecstatic. While yes, four attempts isn't the first try streak we had during the last few gyms, the fact that it took me less attempts to beat an Elite Four member than the second gym leader honestly proves to me that I was learning. My confidence was now justified and the upcoming challenges were nothing I was worried about. The final day dawns. One Elite Four member was down, and I was ready to get Blitzel through the rest of these fights. Of our remaining three choices, I decided to go for Grimsley. While his team did have another terrifying ground type, I felt confident that we could set up on his Scrafty enough to help us sweep through the rest of his team. However, what I didn't expect was for the setup-er to become the setup B. Grimsley Scrafty decides to sand attack us constantly, and while this does allow us to X defend and X attack to our heart's content, we end up getting sand attacked until our Blitzel is completely blinded by the Scrafty's pocket sand to negative 6 in accuracy. We can take out the Scrafty with two sparks that surprisingly land, but Nair's terrible aim becomes our downfall, and Crocodile crits an earthquake to take down Blitzel. Alright, one attempt, cool, but that's fine. I'm sure that the second attempt will go better. Maybe Thunder waving out of the gate will help us avoid some of these sand attacks. Quick. No crit, 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 no crit. Huh. 
Okay, maybe the third time's the charm. We take out Scrafty again, not before getting hit by another four sand attacks. Yikes. But we get a wildly lucky crit stomp against Crocodile as well. All we had to do was land a single hit against this Bisharp, and I should be able to one-shot it. Oh, well, that's fine. As long as he doesn't crit, we should... I... I don't get it. We had everything calculated. Grimsley should have been a cakewalk and we lost to sand? Fucking sand? Why does it get everywhere? What happened to the rolling? The answer though, was once again something we referenced earlier in the video, game knowledge. While I thought I was coming into the Elite Four ready, I was still missing some very crucial items in my bag. My confidence was wavering in my attempts and I realized I need to support Nair through these battles as opposed to trying to just brute force a solution. So, with a heavy heart, I decided to accept the L, leaving the Pokemon League so that we could stock up on more battle items, specifically the guard specs, which would protect Nair from the sand attack accuracy drops. After our grocery run, Blitzel and I were ready to dive back into the Elite Four. While I had a chance to choose a different pecking order for who to take on first, I decided that Chantal would be best because, once again, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Plus, since I've already defeated her once, it surely isn't gonna take me as long the second time around, right? Right? Fuck. Despite all of my attempts, I started to struggle once more. This was the lowest my confidence has been since the first street. Hell, it even might be lower. Even though we were able to follow the similar strategy to the first victory over Chantal, it took me a whopping 10 tries to finally get past her. This solo run was starting to take a toll on me, and this was just the first of the Elite Four. Hesitantly, I walked back into Grimsley's room to challenge him. While I had new items and a new strategy, I still was terrified to take his team on once again. However, he's kind of hot, no? You know, there's something about like the the robe, the scarf, his head looking like it's about to fly off his body. Oof, 10 out of 10 would worship. <laughs> attempt one ended with a critical hit crunch and attempt two ends with an unfortunate miscalc of how much an earthquake would do. So with attempt three, I played it safe yet slow. With an initial thunder wave and a guard specs to avoid any sand attacks, we were able to set up four X defends, three X attacks, and a dire hit to help us land some critical hits. With our accuracy still at 100%, we easily land two sparks to take out the Scrafty. The next turn, our dire hit actually lands us a critical stomp, taking out Crocodile before it can even use a move. We face Bisharp once again, but this time we take control of our own destiny and our flame charge Okos it in this timeline with a super effective critical hit. Leopard comes out and I weigh out if it'll go for a fake out for the flinch or for night slash for the crit. Regardless though, a heal seems like the safest option. Leopard goes for the fake out, which does very little, and I knew that the battle was in the bag for us. Let's see it. Yes! Triple crit! Grimsley, after a change in strategy, finally is defeated, meaning we had two more Elite Four members left. For reasons I'll bring up soon, I decided to opt for Caitlyn for the additional experience points, so I approached the sleepy psychic user, and Nair is ready to take on Caitlyn of the Elite Four. Wait, why is there music? Oh my god, is this a death montage? Is energy ball gonna kill? Oh my god. Are you fucking kidding me? Psychic? So, you might be wondering how I got here. 
Well, it was all because of Caitlyn's gooey lead. Ridiculous. This floating fetus of a Pokemon has an extremely high special attack stat, along with stab-boosted psychics and the notorious Focus Blast. Even with the Eviolite Light and an Expedef boost on the first turn, we were taking enough damage to put us around 40% of our HP. And of course, there were always chances of special defense drops from both of these moves. There may have been a better strategy, but the only one I could come up with was setting up an Expedef, hoping that Ridiculous didn't get a crit, hoping that Ridiculous didn't go for Psychic the following turn, hoping that there were no special defense drops, and setting up one more extra death after a focus yeah. miss to allow us to set up more X items. Foolproof, if you ask me. But even though I felt like I was jamming a square block into a circle hole, I knew all I needed was a little luck on our side. On attempt 28, we start off with an initial extra death. After healing the following turn, we finally get our first focus miss in over 30 minutes. This means I could get a second X Bedef up and actually live psychics as long as we don't get crit and stat drops. We can use this moment of luck to get plus 6 special defense increases and a thunder wave out to help us start setting up X attacks. After maxing out our attack and a dire hit, we can finally take out our revenge on Caitlyn's crew. Sigilith, get the f out! Woo! Come on, Musharna, gonna turn you to Musharna. I think we go for Paraflinch. I don't think we kill in one. I don't think we kill in one. Oh no, oh no, am I throwing? Oh God, oh God, okay. Musharna down, last one. Got the tail! It knows I have an evil light! Spark. After 27 losses, we finally take out Sleepy Kate. We now had the final Elite Four member and the one who I feared the most. The fighting type martial artist, Marshall. Oh, I just got that pun. The reason why I held off from doing this battle was because I knew that paralysis and X items would actually be an issue for this fight. Marshall's lead is throw. Not only does this Pokemon have guts, which would increase his attack by 50% if we chose to paralyze him, but it also had bulldoze, which is super effective on our little zebra, and storm throw, a fighting type move that would always result in a crit. However, as I look through our TMs to try and find a solution, I find our one beacon of hope. You remember that TM I told you that was important like 40 minutes ago? The one from Castelia City? The one that wasn't Flash? That's right. It was time to turn Marshall's team of macho men into a bunch of sniveling simps. While this does mean we have to get rid of Flame Charge, the use of Attract on top of Stomp and Paralysis increases our hacks hell. Since Infatuation has a whopping 50% chance of causing a Pokemon to do nothing, if you do the math, the chance that a Pokemon would either be paralyzed, flinched, or infatuated to leave them immobile comes out to a whopping 73.75% chance each time you use Stomp. We've now evolved our paraflinch strategy into a paraflinch infatuation strategy to help us take out these fighting types. For some unknown reason, I decide to go for paralysis against throw the first few attempts, completely forgetting about guts. I assume it might be due to the previous 30 minutes of brain damage I just endured against Caitlyn. So starting on attempt four, my strategy was to start the battle with a tract to throw throw off of his game and use an X defend to live the first hit against us, a guard spec to reduce as many speed drops as possible, and then maxing out our defense and attack the following turns. After three attack increases and a dire hit to boot, it takes us only two sparks to finally take down Marshall's lead. We then quickly take out Sock with two stomps and Conkeldur in two as well with a crucial crit. This battle was in the bag. After one attract, Mian Xiao goes for the jump kick, which shouldn't kill unless... No! Hey, Math Dan here. Attract has a 50% chance of immobilizing Mian Xiao. Jump Kick has a 95% chance of landing. And crits, as we all know, have a 1 in 16 chance of happening in Gen 5. 
there was only a 2.96875% chance for this specific thing to happen. I f***ing hate math. Anyway, attempt 5 and 6 end in crits from the throw as well, so let's just talk about attempt 7. We start off with an attract that allows us to set up defense, attack, and dire hits once more. We take out the throw in 2 and then use the immobilized sock the following turn to further set up our attack and defense, as well as a few boosts to speed. I unfortunately bring Sock down to his sturdy, but in a strange fit of luck, this causes Marshall to use his only full restores on Sock, meaning that we were free to knock out the blue Battlemaster the following turn. Conkelder is paraflinch infatuated for another easy two-hit kill, and all that's left is Marshall's Mian Xiao. He does land another jump kick, triggering my PTSD, but luckily no crit this time around. While another jump kick leaves us in the red, we're able to heal up and then stomp the yard to leave him at a sliver of health. Against all odds, Mian Xiao is able to not let love get in the way. However... Oh! Oh! He took himself out! Huge! We had done it. Blitzel had done it. We had overcome the special defense dropping Chantal, the sand attacking Grimsley, the focus blasting Caitlyn, and the jump kicking Marshall. However, we still had a few challenges to take on before the credits. We take the elevator in the middle of the room, which is just magic, right? Like, there's just straight-up magic in the Pokemon universe. And we start to climb the stairs towards the champion battle. N is facing off against Alder, and with all that talk earlier, I'm sure that Alder has easily kicked this awkward asshole with E. Oh. Well, f***. Anyway, here's my reaction to N calling his castle up from the ground like a damn Megatron. What in the f***ing Bowser's castle is happening right now? What? <laughs> that just happens? Sorry to sound like a Marvel character. Uh, those do that now? Wait, what the fuck? N challenges us to approach the castle in order for everything to be decided. We climb the stairs into the tower and we get to see mother fucking Gorm. He's back. <laughs> After a Avengers Endgame level cutscene where all of the gym leaders of the region returned to help us get past the Seven Sages, this meant that it was time for us to take on N, to help determine the fate of Pokemon and whether they should be freed from the grasp of men, or to allow humans and Pokemon to continue their friendship. As the Darkstone draws in its power, manifesting itself to become the deep black Pokemon of legend, Zekrom, I only had one question. Are you ready, Blitzel? Let's do this. We set up an x Bedef to help us resist the fusion bolts and dragon breaths, while an x Defend helps with a slash. A single speed increase is enough to let us outspeed the electrifying behemoth. I go for a stomp to see how little it does. I instead set up two x attacks to make a dent in the beast. Our first stomp does a little bit of damage, but our second ends up critting, leaving the creature of legend on its back legs. This meant I could go for one last stomp to take out Zekrom with ease. While this Zekrom looks at us to be caught, I knew that we still had to take on N with the true hero of this story. So after catching the Zekrom and renaming it Plot Armor, we let it fall to its vast white brethren so that Nair can once again take the stage. We boost Nair's special defense so that she can take a fusion flare with ease. By rotating healing and special defense increases, we can live all of the extra sensories and fusion flares that this creature throws out. And when we see our first hyper beam, this gives us a free chance to paralyze the shining dragon. We begin setting up X defense as well in order to ready ourselves for the rest of N's team. We then have a chance to max out our attack, and with one final X speed and dire hit, we're ready to show N and the true power of bonding with your Pokemon, understanding your partner, and most importantly, drugs. While Reshiram does set up a Reflect, two hits with a crit allows an everyday zebra to take out the Pokemon of epic proportions. Kling Clang rotates in only for a spark crit to decimate the gears. Vanillix breaks harder than a McDonald's ice cream machine when a crit hits the ice type, breaking him into pieces. Zorark is then brought out, but it's lights out for the dark type with one hit. Caracosta should go down in one, but once again, like clockwork. Oh, Lordy Almighty. Oh, Sturdy, you fuck. Oh. Never punish Dan strikes again. Caracosta goes down soon after, and all that's left is N's final mod, Archaeops while a threat is no match to one last spark.
We thwart N's plans of forced liberation, and he once again goes full face to contemplate the errors in his ways, now accepting that the differences are what can change the world. However, his epiphany is cut short by Getzis, who, after all this time, was actually evil. Oh my god, who would have expected it? Getzis tricked his adopted son for this journey of truth just so that he could become more powerful and control the masses with that strength. After standing idly by as N gets verbally berated by his father, he boldly claims that a Pokemon is just a Pokemon. But Nair and I were here to prove to him that that wasn't the case. It was time for the final battle. It was time to take on Getsus. His Kafagrigus leads the battle. We start off with the tried and true method of attract and para to hack the coffin to a standstill. We increase our special defense by 4 to take any shadow balls that slip by, and then start setting up 4x defenses, healing with full restores whenever we get hit by a toxic. With Kofagrigus constantly being immobilized, we get our X attacks, a dire hit, and an X speed out as well to allow us to snowball our strength. Once we remove our toxic, it was time to pull out a broom called Spark and start sweeping. Kofagrigus digs its own grave and goes down in two sparks. A critical hit the next turn makes Bufalon's hair stand on its end. We burst Seismitoad's bubble with a stomp that flinches first turn and takes him out the next. Hydreigon, Gatsus's terrifying ace, does land a Dragon Pulse, but we can take the hit and attract in response. We are able to get a Thunder Wave out and start stomping. Thanks to a crit, Hydreigon goes down in one. Bisharp somehow lives Spark by a thread and goes for a high chance critical move, Night Slash. However, we manage to dodge the crit, allowing us to take the Dark type out and leave Getsus in check. All that's left was Electros. While this Pokemon does not have any type weaknesses, it does happen to be weak to the female gaze. Attract comes out, and lucky for us, Electros is left immobilized by the power of love. Love will get you killed! What's going on here? Nothing much gets this outside of the fact that we are f***ing sending you home, dude! And with that, we have defeated the final boss of the game. Getsus has gone down, and we are left with N in the throne room. This is when N reveals what our Blitzel said at the very beginning, back in Akumala Town. Our starter had told N that she likes us, and that she wanted to be with us. This was a brand new experience to N, but to me, I wasn't surprised. Even before this Elite Four, before the gym challenges, hell, even before I booted up Black for the first time, I had that same feeling too, towards my favorite Pokemon. You see, back in 2014, I remember beating the story of Omega Ruby, and first running into Zebstrika on a Mirage Island in the postgame. I was mesmerized by the design of the Pokemon, and, as a fan of zebras in real life, I quickly fell in love with Zebstrika and Blitzel as a result. I loved the pair so much that I actually tried to film a Let's Play of Pokemon Black years ago, trying this challenge. And while that never worked out because... Well, because I didn't understand how to use OBS. I never forgot that I wanted to commemorate that love I had for this Pokemon in one way or another. And here we were, nearly 10 years since that moment, and I'm listening to the words of N. He told me to make my dreams come true. But little did he know, it already had. So, what is the best Pokemon? It's the one that you believe in the most. Are you ready, Blitzel? Let's do this.